Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. I'm Adam Meyerson, a vice president here at Heritage. In one of his most famous speeches at Newburgh, New York in 1783, George Washington put down a potential insurrection in the Continental Army with the following words. You will permit me to put on my spectacles for I have grown not only gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. Please permit me to do the same. <laughs> it was 200 years ago today that the father of our country bid farewell to earthly life. His body was laid to rest in the hillside overlooking the Potomac River at his beloved Mount Vernon. But the memory of George Washington lives on. It lives on in the name of our national capital, in the like likeness on our quarters and one dollar bills. It lives on above all in the political institutions of this great self-governing republic that Washington called a sacred union of citizens. And this evening, we celebrate a new book just published by the Intercollegiate Studies Institute based in Wilmington, Delaware. Patriot Sage, George Washington and the American Political Dr Tradition. And you can purchase this book by uh, accessing the website www.isi.org or calling 1-800-526-7022. Patriot Sage is edited by Gary Gregg of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and our own Matthew Spaulding of the Heritage Foundation. We will hear brief remarks from both Gary and Matthew. Gary is the National Director of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and in this position he has managed a national education program spreading ideas of liberty to more than 50,000 students and professors at college campuses across the country. He's also author of several books, including The Presidential Republic, Executive Representation and Deliberate Demo Deliberative Democracy, and he's editor of Vital Remnants, America's Founding and the Western Tradition, also published by ISI. One might say that Gary's remarks this evening will be his farewell address with the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. In just two weeks, he will be taking his wagon, his wife, and his three young children through the Cumberland Gap into the land of Daniel Boone. And there he will occupy the Mitch McConnell Chair in Leadership at the University of Louisville. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Gary Gregg. Thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction, uh, Adam, and uh, you might know that uh, my family, then we hitched that wagon, we still don't have a home to, or a garage to park it in yet in just a few weeks, but we're working on that. Uh, and as soon as I get back tonight, we'll continue working on that. I can't explain, uh, uh, convey to you, I think, what a privilege it is for me to be here this evening at the Heritage Foundation and in Washington, just uh, so close uh, across the Potomac where Washington succumbed for the last time to that uh, untreated cold 200 years ago tonight and about uh, five hours or so from now. I want to thank uh, Adam and uh, Ed Fulner and all the good people at uh, the Heritage Foundation and ISI Books for finding the work that uh, Matthew and I have done worthy of such a nice occasion. And I want to thank you all for coming out tonight and allowing me to enjoy this evening with you. It was about a year and a half ago, and I, like all of you, were treated to one of the lowest exhibitions in the history of the presidency from I did not have sexual relations with that woman, no thumb, uh, to uh, blue stained dresses and uh, uh, sub sub uh, substantiated charges of perjury against our nation's chief law enforcement officer. And it was in that moment that I realized that 18 months later, tonight, we would be 
commemorating that anniversary and knew that I had to do something to uh, help America re remember what leadership is really all about, how to act in office, the importance of private life and private virtue to public life. And I called then the man that whose knowledge of and fidelity to the Washington legacy I trust more than any other in Washington. And Matt and, uh, and I together then set out with the combined forces of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and the Heritage Foundation to do our part in helping remind America of the greatness of our, our Washington. During the past year, ISI, with its strength on America's college campuses, conducted an essay contest helping students remember and uh, reflect upon the life and legacy of our founding father. ISI and the Heritage Foundation then, in June of this year, conducted a conference, convened a meeting of students and faculty at Mount Vernon, and it was those lectures delivered at Mount Vernon in June that formed the basis of the collection that we launched tonight, Patriot Sage. If the book is of any merit, it's not so much because of the work that Matthew and I have done, but I think really due to the sacrifice and the dedication of those scholars that contribute to the volume. Some of them uh, are here this evening. They're an impressive lot from the, uh, uh, the most recognized Washington scholars alive today, Richard Brookheiser, Forrest McDonald, William B. Allen, noted uh, military historians like Victor Davis Hanson and Mac Owens, presidentialists Ryan Barrio, Mark Rosell, and others. The essays all, in their own way, I think, are first rate, and they, and they all, in their own way, show America what we have lost and remind us of what we can have again if we remember the Washington legacy. During the Revolutionary War, General Washington developed a particularly successful tactic meant to deceive the British, who he knew we were, watch were watching him from afar. His campfires lit and left burning brightly, he and his soldiers would sneak off into the night, undetected. Watching the glow of the colonial fires, the British were pacified and content until the morning light then gave evidence to their deception. Washington also lit fires that he meant to guide the uh, the eyes and to guide the conduct of his countrymen, not only in his day, but in future generations. And I think the evidence of how far we have fallen into historical amnesia is so clear today when so few Americans remember today as the 200th anniversary, and there are so few public, uh, public commemorations of this very important, important time, important day in our history. A few days after Washington's death, President John Adams made this remark. His example is complete, and it will teach wisdom and virtue to magistrates, citizens, and men, not only in the present age, but for future generations. If he's remembered at all in our classrooms and textbooks in 1999, he's uh, deconstructed, he is... Uh, uh, tossed aside as a slaveholder or a dead white male, or worst of all, maybe you don't know this yet, uh, but uh, the new one is, you know, because he was a farmer, you know, in Virginia. Uh, he was part of that vast right-wing uh, tobacco uh, uh, conspiracy, and uh, he can't be forgiven for that. Um, when pressed about their knowledge of the Founding father, students today can't go much further than talking about the apocryphal cherry tree episode or that he may have been president. Uh, or as uh, Adam reminded us, he's on our, uh, on our coinage. Sadly, I think we know him, this generation, less than any previous generation in history, and yet I think we need him more. The Washington legacy is as important and timely as every speech by uh, our candidates for president this year. If we look just at the current Republican frontrunner, George W. pledges in every speech that he will uphold the dignity of the office of president. And obvious, uh, he is inviting comparisons with our current president. Um, well, he and his fellow candidates would do well to revisit the life and the legacy and the precedent and the writings uh, of our first president. Washington set the standard for being presidential that remains to this very day unsurpassed. As he himself would write, 
He strove to create, quote, a just medium between much state and too great familiarity. Think about that. He strove to create a just medium between much state and too great familiarity. This, I think, remains the challenge of presidential leadership today, creating a healthy balance between the formality and dignity and proper conduct on the one hand and popular familiarity and democratic accountability on the other. Our age, it seems to me, has fallen too far to one side. Our age is one of hyper-popular politics where the least common denominator too often rules the day. Where Washington strove to exhibit, mo to exhibit the most upright modes of private and public conduct, our public figures too often openly and unashamedly display their inner emotions, discuss on national television such intimate details as their choice of undergarments, and act with the selfishness and hubris of uh, and recklessness, I think, in high office. Modern presidents have a large array of staffs and servants. I know it's no surprise to the Washington crowd here tonight, limousines and motorcades. Um, they live in an opulence and splendor unknown to Washington, and I think so many of them seem so small by his majestic strides. Modern presidents can't be Washingtons. None of the candidates today can be Washingtons, but they can be presidential. I think we have to insist upon it. He is the symbol of proper presidential conduct and should be the lodestone by which those contenders of our own age set their compass. Washington's journal entry for December 13, 1799, records three inches of snow and northeasterly winds at Mount Vernon. The aging former president had been out horse on horseback inspecting his farms when he caught the cold that would then silence him for the final time that next evening. Lying in bed, his last words to his aide, Tobias Lear, were instructions on preparing for his death and ended with a very peaceful, tis well. 200 years ago, tonight, 200 years later, we should all pause and reflecting on his life and legacy, I think, say, tis well. We might also hope that those who are running for the presidency and their fellow citizens would take the time to sit by the fires Washington built to light our path and resolve to restore the office to the honorable place Washington helped secure for it more than two centuries ago. That, I think, is our hope that Patriot Sage will do something to encourage that uh, today. And I thank you for your time, for the great privilege of sharing an evening with you tonight, and uh, uh, enjoy. Thank you so much, Gary, for your work on this book, which is a very readable book, by the way. Uh, and uh, the guests who are here, the ISI Books uh, is giving away copies of Patriot Sage. You can take one with you. For those watching on C-SPAN, uh, again, you can uh, get it at www.isi.org uh, or at 1-800-526-7022. We're now going to hear from our own Matthew Spaulding from the Heritage Foundation. George Washington, it was said, was first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Well, Matthew Spaulding is first in the esteem of his heritage colleagues. Matt's been our director of lectures and educational programs, and he has just been named director you might call him the founding father of our new B. Kenneth Simon Center for American Studies. The Ken Simon Center will be teaching the principles of the founding fathers to members of Congress and their staff. This is a prodigious undertaking. And if any of you have blankets, <laughs> you might send them to Matthew, because for a while it's going to feel like Valley Forge. I might mention that in the spirit of George Washington crossing the Delaware, Matthew has just returned from a Christmas season attack on Trenton, New Jersey. There he testified before the New Jer Jersey legislature on proposed legislation calling for recitation 
of the all men are created equal passage from the Declaration of Independence. Now you might think this would be an uncontroversial proposition, but then again, you might not realize how ferociously this has been resisted by organizations such as the New, or uh, the New Jersey Organization for Women and the New Jersey Education Association. Matt is a George Washington scholar, co-author of the definitive book on the Farewell Address, published just a few years ago by Roman and Littlefield. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Matthew Spaulding. Thank you, Adam, for uh, your more than kind words. And thank you, Gary, for your remarks. Thank you for all of my uh, friends that are here this evening to support us in this, this book. If we sound a little tired and weak, it's because we've been doing radio interviews all day. Uh, my first interview was at 6.15 this morning to a Catholic radio station. They wanted to know how often Washington took the Eucharist. And then later today, of course, we went over and talked to uh, G. Gordon Liddy, and he wanted to know what caliber of weapon Washington <laughs> preferred. And there are just so many important questions to be answered about George Washington. Uh, we all know, of course, or should know, the important biographical details of Washington's life. It is fair to say that during his lifetime, he was literally at the center of every important and major political event of his day. The move for independence, the Revolutionary War, the Constitutional Convention, the very formation of the nation. In each of these cases, his support was crucial to the, to the success of the event. What I wanted to do this evening is speak briefly about three grand themes of his life, drawing out what he can teach us today. Washington upheld each of these ideas, and for that, we modern Americans ought to be profoundly thankful. The first theme in Washington's life is human liberty. We often take for granted the liberty we enjoy, forgetting that in 1776, the notion of a, of a nation based on the idea of liberty was but a figment of the imagination. Yes, there were the petty republics of Greece and Rome, and yes, folks like Jefferson, Madison, and Hamilton, not to mention the likes of Locke and Montesquieu, had conceptualized the idea but to bring about a nation conceived in liberty was a radical idea. And yet, from the very first, this was George Washington's sole objective. In 1775, he writes how he was learning about the common law from folks like Jefferson and George Mason. And yet, it was an innate spirit of freedom that convinced him of the wrongness of the British cause and the rightness of the Americans. He took to the field, he told us, for the sake of civil and religious liberty. Indeed, he saw America as the last great opportunity to prove, once and for all, that free government was possible. That is why he says in his first inaugural that the, that the preservation of the sacred fire of liberty and the destiny of the Republican model of government are justly considered as deeply, perhaps as finely, staked on the experiment entrusted to the American people. At every step along the way, the creation and the preservation of human liberty was Washington's central concern. As you can imagine, of course, this is no easy task, which brings me to my second great theme, the rule of law. We mustn't forget that at the height of his military power, having achieved a near miraculous victory against the British forces, Washington's own military officers offered to make him king, but he refused. And twice he gave up political power, first as a victorious military general, and then as president when he voluntarily stepped down. The significance of these actions for the cause of free government cannot be overestimated. In his presidency, Washington always hewed very closely to the Constitution, strongly defending but strictly maintaining the powers of his office. His fidelity to the Constitution 
and our fidelity, he advises us in the farewell address, should be as if that document were sacred. The Constitution is at the same time our strongest check against tyranny and the best guardian of our freedom and liberty. Washington reminds us that it deserves our support. This brings me to my final theme, which I see as the great theme of Washington's statesmanship, and that has to do with the question of character. I mean this in two senses. First, in the sense that Washington keenly understood and constantly spoke of how character is necessary for Republican government. We see the concern for moral virtue throughout his letters, especially to his young correspondents. George Washington was, of course, a strong defender of religious liberty. Some of his best and most powerful letters speak to this topic. Nevertheless, he also agreed with a certain mixing of religion and politics at the political level. Why? Because, as he says in his farewell address, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism, who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firm props of the duties of men and citizens. But there's a second sense in which I mean to speak of character, and that has to do with Washington's own character. We often forget the degree to which his character, his sense of self-sacrifice and duty, of moderation and prudence, and of fidelity to the law and the Constitution, played a key political role in the American founding. The moderation and virtue of a single character, Thomas Jefferson wrote of Washington, probably prevented this revolution from being closed, as most others have been, by a subversion of that liberty it was attended intended to establish. The key for Washington was that there was no radical distinction, as there is today, between private character, the moral virtues, and public character, meaning one's political judgment and practical wisdom. For Washington, these realms were fundamentally connected and intertwined. In the end, we now know that what Washington knew the worth of human liberty, the dignity of the rule of law, and the, the nobility of character are true, and we are just remembering that fact. As we begin to celebrate the end of the American century, let us not forget those who made the American century possible. That this anniversary falls just weeks prior to the new century, prior to the new millennium, is providential. It reminds us that as we look ahead, we ought to look back, not back to some mythical moment of the American past, but to the true roots of our national greatness. Daniel Webster observed on the 100th anniversary of Washington's birth, to him who denies or doubts whether our fervid liberty can be combined with law, with order with the security of property, with the pursuits and advancement of happiness, to him who denies that our forms of government are capable of producing exaltation of soul and the passion of true glory, to him who denies that we have contributed anything to the stock of great lessons and great examples, to all these I reply by pointing to Washington. And so on this, the 200th anniversary of Washington's death, please join me in a toast to his life and legacy. To the soldier, commander, hero, legislator, president, patriot, and sage, without whom the reality of America would have remained but a dream. To Washington. Yay. 
we would be happy, uh, Gary and myself, to entertain any questions anybody has before we continue the reception. Well, Matt would be. <laughs> what was that for a website? <laughs> we'll pass up that possibility. www.isi.org. And I just got word that uh, C-SPAN audience, if they say C-SPAN sent them, can get 30% off. <laughs> That's one uh, first question. Uh, we used to celebrate Washington's birthday, but now we celebrate President's Day, presumably to honor Warren Harding and Millard Fillmore and other great presidents. <laughs> Should we be returning to the celebration of Washington's birthday? Well, some of us already have, Adam, but I don't know where you've been. <laughs> but we'll forgive you on that. and. Uh, and uh, there's a good book to help remind you of that uh, in a few, uh, uh, a few months. Uh, I think we absolutely should. That was one question we talked about on, on uh, some radio programs today. Um, all presents are not created equal, and uh, we know that for sure. And, uh, uh, and I think we absolutely should. It c should come back to uh, celebrating the day uh, Washington, who founded the presidency, started the presidency, uh, set the precedence uh, for almost everything good about the office, and uh, uh, here, here, we absolutely need to get back to that. Ronald Reagan was pretty successful in um, managing strong personalities in his cabinet. And I was wondering if you would study George Washington. Do you have a view of, of why Washington was so <coughs> successful in harmonizing people like Hamilton and Jefferson and other strong people um, who were often at odds in the early republic? Uh, no, that's. Um uh, it's an important question to understand how, in Washington's own cabinet, he could reconcile the likes of Hamilton and Jefferson, not to mention his own vice president, John Adams, who literally uh, looked up to Washington as he had to. Um, I think the answer to that question turns upon our understanding of Washington's character in, in the broadest sense of the term. That is, the things which became the disagreements leading to the political parties, the rise of political parties, were, were held together under Washington's leadership. Uh, and that was because by the sheer force of his character, the, the domineering uh, objectives that he held in uh, establishing a constitution and the rule of law and uh, keeping that, that nation alive, I, I think forced them to agree at the most important level um, and allow their political differences to come out uh, while still maintaining that fundamental agreement. Well, if there are no other questions, uh, we, can, uh, we can continue. Oh, Father. What is, what is it that made Washington a hero in terms of his virtue? This is a man, as far as I can see, that very few people, contemporaries, had bad things to say about him, at least when he reached the point of being a president and so on. What was his upbringing like in such a way that he developed his virtues that he'd be almost universally admired even by people who might have disagreed with him? I think the key aspects of his upbringing that shaped his character um, had to do with his own moral formation. Uh, the, the, the most famous influence upon him, of course, was the famous copybook uh, of uh, Lessons for Civic Life. Uh, it has an 18th century sense to it, of course, having to do with uh, the rules by which you would remove spittle from someone's coat, that kind of thing. Um, it's quite quaint, but, but having said that, the, the moral lessons are still the same. Uh, uh, civility and very simple habits are the groundwork for one's uh, larger sense of character. Uh, and for Washington, the great challenge and the great success in, of his own uh, sense of virtue was the degree over the course of his life that he came to control his own passions. Uh, he was a man prone to anger, as we famously know at some of his battles. Uh, but he successfully controlled his anger uh, and came to control his own uh, his own passions and rule himself uh, by his uh, by his prudence. Uh, that I think became the backbone of his success. Thomas Jefferson, in a letter uh, written uh, a little bit later after Jefferson was president, uh, recognized as much when he said that on the one hand Washington was not a Bacon, Newton, or Locke, uh, but nevertheless he was a great man, indeed the greatest of men because he had a strong character and practiced the virtue of prudence. 
I could, uh, I'm, I, I want to flippantly answer uh, as a great question about how he became a, uh, a virtuous man is, you know, he didn't go to college. And, uh, uh, but uh, but there, are, there are several things I want to add. Matt, what I've said, Matt was exactly right. Um, there are certain things as well to consider is that uh, he was a farmer. And there are certain agrarian ideals that modern society doesn't un understand. But if you read Madison and you read Jefferson and you read Washington, they write about the moral importance of agriculture, of tilling the soil. I think that's very important. Uh, we also look at his uh, you know, being tested in fire of battle, uh, not just as a general, but as a, a soldier, uh, having, shorts, uh, uh, having uh, horses shot out from under him, his coats being riddled with bullets, never uh, being uh, scathed. Um, he was a man who uh, was very close to, uh, uh, to, to battle and to death, potentially many times. Um, we also, as might say, and, and just to elaborate on a point that Matt just made, Washington saw or understood that we can make ourselves, through proper conduct, what we want to be. And he lived in an age where not everything went. Uh, it was there were differences made and he took the highest possible conduct he exhibited on the outside and understood that, that would help create the inner man and it did and uh, that's something that's more difficult as well for us to understand in a society of relativism where we uh, where any anything goes essentially in conduct that's a great question do you think that today George Washington would be a successful politician <laughs> <laughs> that's um, uh, that's always a very hard question to answer. There are always these uh, references to Lincoln having uh, a high kind of squeaky voice, whether he would be successful in today's media uh, era. Um, I, I suppose I would answer by giving, uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, um, on the one hand, if you read Washington's prose and imagine his speeches, I don't think they would translate well into uh, soundbite media. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I am struck by Washington's political prowess. Uh, he was a serious man, he was a serious politician, uh, and what he was about was, was creating a country and he would do what was necessary to do it. And that, so, so I, I think he had the instinct and the genius to be a successful politician. Having said that, I think the, the more general question is whether he would be appalled by the atmosphere in which our politics pl take place. That's, uh, I guess, a, a broader and lengthier uh, question. Some years ago, I uh, wrote the uh, farewell address, <laughs> and I remember some specific words in there, and maybe you can uh, draw who I might have been envisioning, but it said, uh, end of fatal tendency by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men may seize the reins of power, sacrifice the interests of their own country without odium, sometimes even with popularity. I uh, wonder if you might have some comments on uh, the common current political scene. Matt is the expert on the farewell address, so I'll turn that over to him. The, um, uh, line of the farewell address clearly refers to uh, <clears throat> those individuals who would take advantage of the uh, weaknesses the potential weaknesses in the Constitution and in the rule of law to serve their own interests, their own narrow interests. Um, and as you've uh, described his own words, he, he's really describing those who suffer from, from a tyranny of their own soul. That is, those who are tyrants uh, in reality, but use the forms of constitutional government to serve the ends of tyranny. Um, that, I think, was the challenge he understood uh, and that would be the greatest threat to free government. Um, he was concerned about morality on behalf of the people and the citizenry and their maintenance of Republican virtues. But on the other hand, he's clearly concerned and was always very concerned about the potential of tyrannical leaders. Um, how we apply that observation to current politics, uh, I will not say. Uh, I think the power of Washington's words um, make their own comment, and uh, the, the, the wisdom of his observations, um, it, it, is, it is virtually self-evident how it should be applied. To follow up on that other question, 
this goes beyond Washington. Did any of the founding fathers from your readings have a notion of a professional political class? <laughs> I mean, the notion of the farmer president, the Cincinnati Zunabal, legend like that, that, that statesmanship was a part-time avocation, a way to serve. Did they, were there any writings that, I mean, obviously Washington's was not a man of letters in the way the other founding fathers were, but was there any, dis, was there any notion of, of the development of a class, a political class, like we see today? There may be a reason why uh, they built Was they built Washington on a swamp, and uh, before there was air conditioning, and uh, uh, there was no nothing else here that would uh, eventually make you want to come here uh, to uh, uh, here. Washington was the uh, I'll reflect. I think uh, uh, Dr. Spalding will have a better answer than I, but he was the reluctant politician, and I think that's something to consider. Uh, and I think there's a whole lot to unpack there is he is a man that didn't embrace power and didn't do anything to get it, um, but shunned it time and time again, especially after he had built his reputation. He was the greatest man in the Western world long before he took political office, and, or at least the presidency. And uh, he had nothing to gain from it. It's a lot, uh, I'm reminded of what was said of, uh, someone said of Ronald Reagan, is the, he didn't need the office, the office needed him. That's the same thing with George Washington. Uh, I guess the, uh, what I might add to that is uh, just to make the simple observation that uh, Washington accomplished all that he did without the assistance of things like the American Political Science Association or profession, professional political scientists. Um, he also did what he did without the assistance of a professional political party and uh, the, the professional political elites to which you, uh, to which you refer. Uh, the model of Washington and that whole earlier era, I think, prior to modern political science is the model of statesmanship. Um, and Washington is, is really the statesman par excellence. Um, he was, in, in, in a sense, a reluctant politician, uh, but he was not a reluctant statesman. Uh, every fiber of his being um, contributed to serving and meeting his objectives uh, in war and in politics. Uh, and in that sense, I think that uh, uh, he would not be a professional politician in today's sense. Uh, he would probably scorn professional politicians in today's sense. Um, he was a very different, as were his, uh, his fellow founders, a very different sort of uh, political leader. Um, well, with that, uh, I... On behalf of Heritage uh, and Adam Meyerson, I'd like to thank uh, Gary Gregg, the co-editor of the book, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, please uh, continue to enjoy the reception. The books are here for yours, for those of you that came this evening, or compliments of the publisher. Uh, thank you again for coming, and uh, thank you for coming here to mark Washington's death, but more importantly, celebrate his life and legacy. So thank you and have a good evening. This brings me to my final theme, which I see as the great theme of Washington statesmanship, and that has to do with the question of character. I mean this in two senses. First, in the sense that Washington keenly understood and constantly spoke of how character is necessary for Republican government. We see the concern for moral virtue throughout his letters, especially to his young correspondents. George Washington was, of course, a strong defender of religious liberty. Some of his best and most powerful letters speak to this topic. Nevertheless, he also agreed with a certain mixing of religion and politics at the political level. Why? Because, as he says in his farewell address, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism, who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firm props of the duties of men and citizens. But there's a second sense in which I mean to speak of character, and that has to do with Washington's own character. We often forget the degree to which his character, his sense of self-sacrifice, <laughs> The um, uh, line of the farewell address clearly refers to uh, 
<clears throat> those individuals who would take advantage of the uh, weaknesses, the potential weaknesses in the Constitution and in the rule of law to serve their own interests, their own narrow interests. Um, and as you've uh, described his own words, he, he's really describing those who suffer from, from a tyranny of their own soul. That is, those who are tyrants uh, in reality, but use the forms of constitutional government to serve the ends of tyranny. Um, that, I think, was the challenge he understood, uh, and that would be the greatest threat to free government. Um, he was concerned about morality on behalf of the people and the citizenry and their maintenance of Republican virtues. But on the other hand, he's clearly concerned and was always very concerned about the potential of tyrannical leaders. Um, how we apply that observation to current politics, uh, I will not say. Uh, I think the power of Washington's words um, make their own comment. And uh, the, the, the wisdom of his observations, um, it, it, is, it is virtually self-evident how it should be applied. follow up on that other question. And the, the nobility of character are true, and we are just remembering that fact. As we begin to celebrate the end of the American century, let us not forget those who made the American century possible. That this anniversary falls just weeks prior to the new century, prior to the new millennium, is providential. It reminds us that as we look ahead, we ought to look back, not back to some mythical moment of the American past, but to the true roots of our national greatness. Daniel Webster observed on the 100th anniversary of Washington's birth. To him who denies our doubts whether our fervid liberty can be combined with law, with order, with the security of property, with the pursuits and advancement of happiness, to him who denies that our forms of government are capable of producing exaltation of soul and the passion of true glory, to him who denies that we have contributed anything to the stock of great lessons and great examples, to all these I reply by pointing to Washington. And so on this, the two... Again, you can uh, get it at www.isi.org uh, or at 1-800-526-7022. Uh, We're now going to hear from our own Matthew Spaulding from the Heritage Foundation. George Washington, it was said, was first in war, first in peace and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Well, Matthew Spaulding is first in the esteem of his heritage colleagues. Matt's been our director of lectures and educational programs, and he has just been named director, you might call him the founding father, of our new B. Kenneth Simon Center for American Studies. The Ken Simon Center will be teaching the principles of the founding fathers to members of Congress and their staff. This is a prodigious undertaking. And if any of you have blankets, <laughs> you might send them to Matthew, because for a while it's going to feel like Valley Forge. <laughs> I might mention that in the spirit of George Washington crossing the Delaware, Matthew has just returned from a Christmas season attack on Trenton, New Jersey. There he testified before the New Jer Jersey Legislature, Jersey Organization for Women, and the New Jersey Education Association. Matt is a George Washington scholar, co-author of the definitive book on the Farewell Address, published just a few years ago by Roman and Littlefield. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Matthew Spaulding. Thank you, Adam, for uh, your more than kind words. And thank you, Gary, for your remarks. 
thank you for all of my uh, friends that are here this evening to support us in this, this book. If we sound a little tired and weak, it's because we've been doing radio interviews all day. Uh, my first interview was at 6.15 this morning to a Catholic radio station. They wanted to know how often Washington took the Eucharist. And then later today, of course, we went over and talked to uh, G. Gordon Liddy, and he wanted to know what caliber of weapon Washington preferred. <laughs> And there are just so many important questions to be answered about George Washington. Uh, we all know, of course, or should know, the important biographical details of Washington's life. It is fair to say that during his lifetime, he was literally at the center of every important and major political event of his day. The move for independence, the Revolutionary War, um, make their own comment. and. Uh, the, the, the wisdom of his observations, um, it, it, is, it is virtually self-evident how it should be applied. To follow up on that other question, did, uh, this goes beyond Washington. Did any of the founding fathers from your readings have a notion of a professional political class? <laughs> I mean, the notion of the farmer president, since a not a legend like that, that that statesmanship was a part-time avocation, a way to serve. Did they, were there any writings? That, I mean, obviously, Washington's was not a man of letters in the way the other founders were, but was there any, dis, was there any notion of, of the development of a class, a political class, like we see today? Well, there may be a reason why uh, <laughs> they, built Was they built Washington on a swamp and uh, before there was air conditioning, and uh, uh, there was no, nothing else here that would uh, eventually make you want to come here uh, to... Uh, uh, here, Washington was the. Uh, I'll reflect. I think uh, uh, Dr. Spalding will have a better answer than I. But he was the reluctant politician, and I think that's something to consider. Uh, and I think there's a whole lot to unpack there. Is he is a man that didn't embrace power and didn't do anything to get it, um, but shunned it time and time again, especially after he had built his reputation. He was the greatest man in the Western world long before he took political. Serve their own interests, their own narrow interests. Um, and as you've uh, described his own words, he, he's really describing those who suffer from, from a tyranny of their own soul. That is, those who are tyrants uh, in reality, but use the forms of constitutional government to serve the ends of tyranny. Um, that, I think, was the challenge he understood, uh, and that would be the greatest threat to free government. Um, he was concerned about morality on behalf of the people and the citizenry, and their maintenance of Republican virtues. But on the other hand, he's clearly concerned and was always very concerned about the potential of tyrannical leaders. Um, how we apply that observation to current politics, uh, I will not say. Uh, I think the power of Washington's words um, make their own comment. And uh, the, the, the wisdom of his observations um, it is, it is virtually self-evident how it should be applied. To follow up on that other question, did, I, this goes beyond Washington. Did any of the founding fathers from your readings have a notion of a professional political class? <laughs> I mean, the notion of the farmer president, since a not assumable legend like that, that, that statesmanship was a part-time avocation, a way to serve. Did they, were, the Washington legacy is as important and timely as every speech by uh, our candidates for president this year. If we look just at the current Republican frontrunner, George W. pledges in every speech that he will uphold the dignity of the office of president. And obvious, uh, he is inviting comparisons with our current president. Um, well, he and his fellow candidates would do well to revisit the life and the legacy and the precedent and the writings uh, of our first president. Washington set the standard for being presidential that remains to this very day unsurpassed. As he himself would write, he strove to create, quote, a just medium between much state and too great familiarity. Think about that. He strove to create a just medium between much state and too great familiarity. This, I think, remains the challenge of presidential leadership today creating a healthy balance between the formality and dignity and proper conduct on the one hand 
and popular familiarity and democratic accountability on the other. Our age, it seems to me, has fallen too far to one side. Our age is one of hyper-popular politics where the least common denominator too often rules the day. Where Washington strove to exhibit, mo to exhibit the most upright modes of private and public conduct, our public figure for Republican government. We see the concern for moral virtue throughout his letters, especially to his young correspondents. George Washington was, of course, a strong defender of religious liberty. Some of his best and most powerful letters speak to this topic. Nevertheless, he also agreed with a certain mixing of religion and politics at the political level. Why? Because, as he says in his farewell address, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism, who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firm props of the duties of men and citizens. But there's a second sense in which I mean to speak of character. And that has to do with Washington's own character. We often forget the degree to which his character, his sense of self-sacrifice and duty, of moderation and prudence, and of fidelity to the law and the Constitution, played a key political role in the American founding. The moderation and virtue of a single character, Thomas Jefferson wrote of Washington, probably prevented eyes that we have contributed anything to the stock of great lessons and great examples. To all these I reply by pointing to Washington. And so on this, the 200th anniversary of Washington's death, please join me in a toast to his life and legacy. To the soldier, commander, hero, legislator, president, patriot, and sage, without whom the reality of America would have remained but a dream. To Washington. We would be happy, uh, Gary and myself, to entertain any questions anybody has before we continue the reception. Well, Matt would be. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what was that called? Website? <laughs> we'll pass up that possibility. www.isi.org. And I just got word that uh, C-SPAN audience, if they say C-SPAN sent them, can get 30% off. <laughs> First question. Uh, we used to celebrate Washington's birthday. Most others have been. By a subversion of that liberty, it was attended, intended to establish. The key for Washington was that there was no radical distinction, as there is today, between private character, the moral virtues, and public character, meaning one's political judgment and practical wisdom. For Washington, these realms were fundamentally connected and intertwined. In the end, we now know that what Washington knew, the worth of human liberty, the dignity of the rule of law, and the, the nobility of character are true, and we are just remembering that fact. As we begin to celebrate the end of the American century, let us not forget those who made the American century possible. That this anniversary falls just weeks prior to the new century, prior to the new millennium, is providential. It reminds us that as we look ahead, we ought to look back, not back to some mythical moment of the American past, but to the true roots of our national greatness. Daniel Webster, observed on the 100th anniversary of Washington's birth. To him who denies or doubts 